Good morning and welcome to the National Institute of Justice. For those of you coming from out of town, welcome to Washington, D.C. And for everyone joining us by WebEx, thank you for calling in. I couldn't be more excited to welcome you here today to discuss a topic very near and dear to my heart, what works in reentry. NIJ is the research and evaluation arm of the U.S. Department of Justice. Our mission is to advance justice through rigorous research and science. Our work spans a wide portfolio that includes every aspect of the criminal and juvenile justice systems. In all our work, we aim to answer the most pressing and important questions of the field. What works in reentry is chief among these questions. As many of you as many of the people in this room know better than anyone, reentry is a really important issue in American corrections. 95% of inmates in state and federal prisons will be released eventually. And studies have consistently shown high rates of recidivism, with more than three quarters of released offenders being rearrested within five years. I cannot overstate the importance in implementing programs to change these statistics. It's not enough to simply believe that a program is effective or to feel good about it. We need data and evidence to substantiate claims of effectiveness. When we employ rigorous research, we are able to understand and scale what works and stop doing what doesn't work. Too often, the corrections field doesn't make decisions based on what we know works. Don't feel bad because in Washington, D.C., we do the same thing. And too often, when corrections leaders turn to evidence for guidance, the research doesn't give clear definitive answers. This calls for a new or a renewed commitment among the research field to provide better answers. It also calls for NIJ to fund research to inform the high stakes decisions that corrections leaders need to make. To guide this future, NIJ recently completed our correction strategic research plan. This plan details our funding priorities and corrections over the next five years, and I encourage you to read it online. I am welcoming you here today, this morning, not only as the director of NIJ, but also as the executive director of the Federal Interagency Council on Crime Prevention and Improving Reentry. That's a mouthful, so I just like to call it the Reentry Council. The Reentry Council was created by an executive order issued by President Trump earlier this year. The Justice Department is a key partner in the Reentry Council, and Attorney General Sessions appointed me as the Executive Director. Reentry Council was mandated to develop recommendations for evidence-based reforms that will prevent crime, facilitate reentry, and reduce recidivism. The President's Executive Order gave the Reentry Council a clear mandate to use rigorous evidence in forming recommendations. The only way we are going to accomplish this mission of reducing recidivism is to use rigorous evidence as our guide. This means we can't ignore evidence that is inconvenient. If rigorous research strongly indicates that an approach does not work, the Reentry Council cannot ignore it. Conversely, we cannot ignore what works. We need to be honest about the evidence. Not only do we need to be honest about the evidence, but we must avoid confusing correlation with causation. For example, knowing that crime rates declined at the particular state adopted certain criminal justice reforms is not rigorous evidence. Since the early 1990s, crime rates have fallen practically everywhere. In fact, general claims that certain policies or reforms led to declining crime rates in a particular state likely confuses correlation with causation because socioeconomic factors and other criminal justice policies may have played a significant role in changing crime rates. Crime rates may have changed or continue to decline even without the reforms, or the reforms may have slowed the declining crime trend. We simply do not know the impact of reforms. Promoting public safety is far too important to rely on such flimsy evidence. That being said, the Rancheri Council and NIJ have been very busy. Over the last few months, we have held a focus group on prosecution and diversion, and we have upcoming focus groups on juvenile justice and drugs. Since we began our earlier work, I've visited state facilities, state prison facilities in Colorado, 
Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. Federal facilities in Colorado, West Virginia, and Maryland, and have met with corrections personnel at local jails and in community supervision agencies. The Ramsey Council is interested in compiling evidence on what works. We also aim to establish a research agenda that addresses gaps in the empirical literature and the needs of correction professionals to engage in this important work every day. We are discussing reentry today because of the juveniles and adults involved in the juvenile and criminal justice systems. It's critical that we better understand these populations and how to improve their chances of success as a return to their communities. For example, women are the fastest growing incarcerated population, yet one of the least examined. In December, I'll travel to Sacramento to visit a program for female inmates implemented by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation in cooperation with their local community. The Reentry Council has a lot of work to do ahead of us, but I am confident we are up to the task, and I hope you'll stay tuned and follow our forthcoming reports with further updates. Today's seminar is What Works in Reentry, but it's an important point that reentry, recidivism, and crime prevention are persistently linked problems in America. Today's panelists come from diverse backgrounds and can speak from experience in corrections, probation, and parole, and juvenile justice. I'm eager to turn things over to our panelists to talk about the good work we are doing in employing research to inform policy and practice in their agencies. Before I do, I want to thank a few people who served behind the scenes. Thank you to NIJ's Rhea Walker and Marie Garcia for their work in organizing this event. I just want to give them a little clap. I really greatly appreciate their, um, their assistance and just getting things done in general. I also like to thank Hugh Hewitts for allowing, uh, for actually for being a partner in discussing what works and hopefully he'll be able to attend us today. And finally, I'd like to thank our panelists. I will let our panelists speak further to their backgrounds and expertise, but I'd like to give a brief introduction. Ms. Terry McDonald is the Chief Probation Officer with the Los Angeles County Probation Department, which is the largest probation department in the world. Ms. McDonald brings unique perspective to our panel because she has provided executive overstate of the state of California's parole, prison, juvenile justice system, the county of Los Angeles jail system, and most recently, the county of Los Angeles probation system. Each of these systems are the largest of their kind in the country. Wow. Dr. Grant Du is the director of research and evaluation for the Minnesota Department of Corrections, where he evaluates corrections programs, develops risk assessment instruments, and forecasts the state's prison population. I applaud his commitment, not only to drawing on research, but to conducting it himself. He has published more than 60 articles in peer-reviewed journals on a wide variety of correctional topics. Dr. Alex McLaren is the Acting Assistant Director of the Reentry Services Division for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I'm glad to have Alex here to speak about how the BOP's programming prepares inmates for release, what they do to attract their success, and how residential reentry centers help inmates transition back to their communities. Finally, I'd like to introduce John Wetzel. He's the secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections and the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole. In addition to being on our panel, I'd like to thank him for hosting me and some of my staff when we visited some of our facilities early this year. I'll turn it over to you, John. Is this thing on? Yeah. It's a good start, huh? Well, good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, obviously, reentry is, is such an important topic, uh, and the opportunity to, to talk about what works, uh, you know, I just can't thank you enough. Uh, I think this hasn't been talked about enough, and I think... Um, sadly, often we, we talk about it in real simplistic, like pass-fail um, context, and, and the reality is it's a lot more nuanced than that, that no matter what we do, whether we do anything or whether we do all kinds of things, folks are going to get out of prison, and folks are going to get out of jail, and they're going to come back to our communities. And 
I think uh, from my perspective, and certainly in Pennsylvania, we feel responsibility uh, to, to adhere to what, what our field says we are, which is corrections. That when someone's involved in the criminal justice system at the front end, what we want on the back end is that they're less likely to commit a crime. And I think that gets lost sometimes in the conversation. But from my perspective, the only path forward <clears throat> is that we have the, the courage and the guts to measure what we do. And when we do something that doesn't work, we change it. And I think that's critical. So, you know, we, we can talk about individual programs, but I think um, as a field, we, it's really about a process, a process that measures things and adjusts. Uh, I spent, uh, this is supposed to be an introduction, right? Not a speech. Um, but I, I spent my entire, I'm a lifer. This is all I've ever done is corrections. I started when I was 20 years old, uh, part-time as a correctional officer when I went to college and worked my way up mostly in the jail world until the past eight years where I've been honored to run the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Uh, and we've been on quite a journey in Pennsylvania over the past eight years. And we've seen a population reduction of about 4,000 uh, inmates. I inherited a system that was growing by 1,500 inmates a year. Um, and, and we did that primarily by looking internal and, and looking at things we weren't doing good enough. And some of it, frankly, that gets in the way of good reentry is bureaucracy. And we've always done it that way. But I, I will tell you, we're certainly committed to, to have individuals leave our system better than they came in. And that sounds weird when we talk about corrections. But to me, that's what it's really about. What it's really about is putting someone in a, in a situation where they can be successful after prison. You're up, sister. Nobody wants to follow John Wetzel. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for inviting uh, us to this important discussion. Uh, I have a, a, a belief about what's happened in America, uh, and, it's, and it's informed from a lifetime of doing this work. You heard me say I oversaw California's sprawling state prisons, state parole, state juvenile justice systems, the largest in the nation, and then the largest jail in America the largest mental health treatment facility in America, which is in the Los Angeles County Jail System, and now the largest probation system in America. And, and we've spent a whole lot of time focusing on arresting bodies. It's not difficult to arrest bodies, right? You can arrest bodies, but that's not a better public safety perspective than arresting behaviors. And reentry really is about thinking about uh, what people need to change their behavior on intake. Reentry should begin at intake. It doesn't matter if that intake's in the local county jail. It doesn't matter if that intake doesn't actually result in detention. Maybe they've been arrested and the courts are asking probation to take a look at them. But looking at people's needs and the pathways that bring them to the work that we do. The fact of the matter is, is that John and I have been required to do work that I think is much more profoundly addressed through the health systems. Reentry is they come from communities and they return to communities. And it's that relationship with communities, with the substance abuse community, the mental health community, the children and family services, starting to think in terms about we cannot do this alone. Uh, prisons are, and jails are the black boxes of the reentry system. People come in. We do risk and needs assessment. We put them in drug treatment programs. We try to deal with trauma if we are involved in our thinking about detention services. And then they return to the community and somebody asks us to measure, measure recidivism. Yet John could not tell you whether or not the inmates leaving his charge really are getting the kind of mental health services they need, the kind of drug treatment services they need, the kind of gainful employment that they need. So to me, if we're going to move forward as a society and as a nation to improve reentry outcomes, it shouldn't just be the corrections people sitting on this panel, right? I think we need to start to charge our, our head of health and human services to sit with us, our head of uh, drug treatment services. Uh, in our juvenile facilities, and, and this is not a lecture, so I'll stop. In our juvenile facilities, 95% of all young people that we have in detention in Los Angeles County have been touched by the child welfare system. Half of all adults that we send to state prison have been touched by the child welfare system. Reentry begins at intake. Reentry begins to understand the trauma informed pathways that people come to us. There does have to be accountability for criminal behavior, but that accountability is not always a jail bed or a prison bed. Sometimes that accountability, honestly, can be a hug. Alex. 
Okay. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here today. Um, like my colleagues, I have spent my... Oh! Did I do it right? There we go. Yay! <laughs> I'm no good at technology. <laughs> like my colleagues, I've spent my career choosing corrections and being in corrections. So um, I am a clinical psychologist, but have done more than 15 years in federal law enforcement with the Bureau of Prisons. And I would like to maybe do something a little bit different, talk about our agency, just because it is fairly large in scope, and then maybe some of the things that we're doing around reentry. We have 122 facilities located nationwide, five security levels. We house pretrial offenders, people who are sentenced, people who have been forensically adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. And we even have a unit that houses folks who are post-sentence and have been civilly committed as sexually dangerous. We have over 180,000 inmates in our custody. About 6% are female, about 14% are sex offenders, give or take 20% are non-US citizens. We see about 30 different religions, countless individual religious practitioners, almost 500 individuals that have a terrorism nexus. And I think the point I wanna make is that when we're looking at addressing the needs of this group, we're talking about something that is very, very broad in scope because it's such a very diverse group. The mission of the agency is twofold, to securely and safely confine offenders, so that's your safety piece, but also to provide self-improvement opportunities, and that's your re-entry piece, and that's always been part of what we do. I think David mentioned that about 95% of people are returning to the communities when they come to prison. And we're proud that our recidivism rate is about 34%, which is about half of that that you see in some other systems. In the Bureau, just like you say, it begins at intake, we say reentry begins on the first day. Um, so it's good to see that we're having sort of some similar trains of thought there. When somebody comes into our system, we usually have a decent amount of information about them, and so we're able to use that to designate them to the appropriate security level. But we're also able to designate them to the appropriate care level. And what I mean when I say that is we can look based on what we have before we meet them and see what level of intensity they need service-wise for both medical and mental health needs. And our facilities aren't just categorized by security, but also by the availability of different kinds of services. So starting right at the beginning, we can place somebody in a situation where they're gonna have the access to the best programs for them. And then once they're on site, they get assessed and then they get reassessed twice every year to figure out exactly what their needs are and set individual goals. And I think I wanna pause there when I say needs. I certainly mean the criminogenic needs that we talk about, things that are specifically programs and services designed to address recidivism. But we also address areas that might provide other benefits to people. This could include parenting programs, healthy relationship building, mental health treatment, leisure time management, or support groups for folks that are going through unique challenges in life. I like to talk about our programs. That's what I do. Um, and I think a lot of people are familiar with things like our residential drug abuse program, which does have a decent body of research behind it. But I wanted to highlight two new innovative programs that we have implemented relatively recently. One is FIT. FIT stands for Female Integrated Treatment. This is one of our gender responsive programs. So we recognize, and I know somebody mentioned it, that women are a small but um, different group within our correctional population. Our female population has not actually seen an increase, even though many have. Ours has been a fairly stable six to 7% for many years. But there's a growing body of research that suggests that gender specific or gender neutral programs are beneficial to women and that maybe they follow different pathways into prison and therefore have different needs to take an off ramp out of prison. Um, the FIT program is grounded in the evidence of cognitive behavioral therapy, therapeutic communities and integrated treatment. And what we're doing here is we are running an entire prison as a gender responsive treatment facility. So, Everybody in the entire facility is engaged in that treatment community. We focus on serious mental illness, trauma, drug abuse treatment, and vocational and occupational opportunities. So people are able to take an integrated approach to receiving all of that. And then they all have individual goals. When we look at outcomes of this, what we're really being able to see right now is how many people we can enroll in treatment. So it isn't just 
reentry. It's what other positive outcomes do we have? We've got an entire facility engaged in CBT, which we know is an effective treatment. Something related to that are our secure mental health programs. This is where we take our sickest, often violent individuals who have psychotic disorders or personality disorders. These programs are also couched in cognitive behavioral and therapeutic community approaches. And while these programs aren't necessarily designed to help people re-enter the community per se, they help them re-enter general population. So these are folks that might normally spend a great deal of time in restrictive settings because of their behavior. And again, now we have them out and enrolled in treatment. And just to wrap up, the Bureau releases about 61,000 inmates a year. The bulk of those are going to the community, but some of them are going to other law enforcement agencies or elsewhere. About 73% of the people that are returning to the US streets participate in a residential reentry center, which are the 229 bureau operated, or privately operated, but contracted by the bureau halfway houses. And while they're there, the inmates continue working on all of the things that they did while in our custody, like mental health care, but they're also focused on securing housing and employment. That's kind of my summary of the agency. Grant. Good morning. I'm Grant Dewey. It's my honor and privilege to be a part of the event this morning. Um, one of the things that Dr. Molhausen noted at the beginning is, is how high the recidivism rates are for those who get released from prison, whether at the federal level or from state prison systems. And those recidivism rates ha have been adduced as, as, as evidence for our prison systems as being broken. They don't work. In fact, nothing works. That, that's, an, that's an old conclusion that was drawn back in the 1970s. Nothing works when it comes to correctional programming. There's been a lot of evidence that's actually accumulated over the last four decades or so that, that has shown that there are quite a few interventions that are effective and that do work when it comes to producing better outcomes for correctional populations. Outcomes like employment, misconduct, recidivism, cost avoidance. But I would like to focus on a few reasons why I think uh, that that knowledge that we've gained from, the, from the, that literature, which is known as the what works literature, hasn't translated into better outcomes. Um, first is, I think the correctional field has struggled to make what works work. And what I mean by that is that, that there's been difficulty in terms of implementing and running programs like they should be run, program uh, fidelity. But I think a broader part is that for researchers like myself, there hasn't been enough attention that's been focused on implementation science. It's sort of like the field has done a good job of identifying those products that work well but it hasn't done a good job of providing everyone with instructions as to how to make those products work well. The second uh, reason why I think that, that the knowledge hasn't translated into to better outcomes is that the what works literature has really focused on identifying those interventions uh, that are shown to be effective or, or identifying types of interventions that are effective in producing good outcomes, uh, but that literature hasn't shed as much light on how much or how much programming do individuals need so that they can desist from crime. Uh, and, and that relates more to dosage. Um, one of the things that, that Dr. McLaren mentioned is that cognitive behavioral therapy is an effective intervention. And, and the literature has consistently shown that. But what if only one or two percent of a state's prison population or the, the federal prison population participates in CBT. Is that going to have an impact on overall recidivism rates? Probably not. But what if instead of 2%, it's 20% of a state or federal prison population is participating in CBT? Would that, would that affect overall recidivism rates? Possibly. But one of the things that I think we've learned from the What Works literature is that if you provide programming to lower risk individuals that it can, 
that it can produce worse outcomes. And, and that's certainly true, but I think too often that's been used as an excuse to do nothing. And what we see when we warehouse individuals in our prison systems, it produces a slew of bad outcomes. It increases misconduct, it increases recidivism, it also increases unemployment for those who get released from prison, and I would argue it's a costly, wasteful practice. And I think we should be focusing more on dosage and more specifically the extent to which inmates are participating in programming. And I would argue that, that we are under-treating or under-programming many individuals who are in prison. And finally, and, the, and, and this relates to the second point, is that, that I would argue that this lack of programming, it's a byproduct of how prisons have been designed and constructed. It's important to keep in mind that most of the correctional facilities across the United States were designed and built decades ago. They weren't built with the idea of how can we maximize the delivery of effective programming to individuals in our, in our facilities. Instead, the emphasis has been on isolation, security, and control. However, that, that can sometimes be at odds with producing individuals who, when they get released, are, are going to desist from crime. And so I would argue that, that we don't have to have prison systems that are, that are criminogenic finishing schools for crime, but instead I think if we focus more on making them program rich environments that could produce better outcomes, I think we can do that, but I also think that would require a fundamental shift in how we view and use prisons. Thank you, Grant. <clears throat> I'm going to try to help facilitate the discussion, but I fully expect the panelists to have a free going dialogue as well and just don't be contained by the questions I'm gonna ask. Um, first thing I wanna say is, question I wanna ask is, based on your experience and expertise, what are the biggest problems facing corrections generally and reentry specifically? Design is probably one of the issues that was mentioned. I think really uh, culture eats intention for breakfast. You've heard that. I didn't make that up. Uh, the, the circumstances in which we hired our employees and trained them, if our hiring of employees and training them was around command and control, whether it's prisons or our parole personnel, it's very difficult to begin to get them to pivot in their thinking about how you treat uh, inmates, and I mean treat in a rehabilitative term, uh, not just a, how you interact with them. Uh, if the environments in which our employees work are stressful in and of themselves and are traumatizing, I, uh, I remember the day I was working a, a secure mental health treatment facility uh, serving food to inmates in a lockup unit in green slickers, uh, rain suits, because you would feed the inmates and they would gas you. Uh, of course, they gassed you. Uh, they didn't gas you because they were mentally ill. They gassed you because of the conditions in which the inmates were forced to live. And uh, imagine me as a correctional officer, how I thought about rehabilitative programming there. So I think uh, starting to address who we're hiring, how we're onboarding them, how we value them, what, what we reward, <coughs> if we don't do that, all of the best intentions go to the wayside. You know, we are in the human business. We're in the human interaction business. And if our correctional staff and our practitioners aren't taught about the pathways that bring people to us, if we continue to say, what is wrong with you, right? Isn't that what we say to inmates when they're in court? What is wrong with you as opposed to what has happened with you and what do you need? Until we begin to pivot that thinking around it, the best of intentions, whether it's 2% CBT, uh, and the truth of the matter is the staff aren't well trained in CBT. And so we, we give them a, you know, an eight hour course and say, go do good CBT. And, and that I think is going to be the struggle in detention facilities around reentry services. And if they're overcrowded, under attended, uh, all of the stressors around conditions, uh, noise, heating and cooling, vying for limited resources, if we don't address those, 
Nothing rehabilitative happens inside those environments. Okay, are we gonna move this way this time? Okay, <laughs> I don't wanna take anybody's spot. Um, I liked what you had to say. Um, I feel like there are so many good answers to this question in terms of what are challenges. Look, prison itself is a challenge. You are taking people out of their community and they're losing privilege and they are losing freedom and they are losing contact. But I think something that is a challenge facing corrections today is drugs. Um, and it's always been a problem. Um, but I think we're seeing a new frontier of that with opioids and synthetic drugs, things that have ways to come into the system that are, are maybe different than traditional ways of coming in. And symptoms that are very, very alarming, they can be not only ingested by the person who means to ingest them, but by others. Um, and then just what treatment is most effective for these new drugs because they, they are relatively new to us. On the good side of that, we've long had in the Bureau and certainly in other places effective substance use treatment programs, but we know that a good two-thirds of offenders in any given setting have substance use histories and even with all of the treatment, um, we're still seeing new and different drugs and people relapsing. And I, I feel like that's the biggest challenge today. All right, right button, thanks. Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the, the realities of uh, American criminal justice is that we deliver most of our behavioral health services through a system that wasn't designed to do so. And, and that's really, I mean, if you look at the, the fundamental structure of corrections, you know, care, custody, and control is that high bar we set like four decades ago, and we're a slow system to shift. And the notion, and, and you know, we're pretty fortunate in Pennsylvania in that we have, we're a well-resourced system with, with services, but I think the fundamental question is, should we be, be delivering those services? And something Terry said earlier about reentry really struck me. I think we've gone at <clears throat> reentry just ass backwards. Like we see reentry as an inside out process when really it should be an outside in process. And, and certainly the jails across the country have, a, have an advantage in that they're a lot stronger connection to the community. But you know, to expect a prison system or a jail system to be experts in delivering mental health services and, uh, and drug and alcohol services and cognitive behavioral services and workforce development and housing um, you know, it's just, it, not only is it not a smart approach, and you can do that, I mean, you can certainly throw resources at it, but does it make sense? And, and I think where we need to shift as a field, and the essence of what we need to do is fund community infrastructures, and corrections folks like us need to get over, not let anybody come inside our facilities. And, and um, wouldn't it make sense? I mean, I think government works best when you spend money once on an individual. And, and implicit in that is we put them in the right system, that they're gonna address the needs, right? And so I think reentry is the perfect place where we need to get over ourselves a little bit and start bringing folks in the community who already have an expertise in something. Let them actually come inside, right? Which would be a stretch for some of us. And, and let's get that connection. Cause not only does that money uh, fund individuals coming out of prison, but it builds a community infrastructure that keeps people out of prison altogether. I mean, listen, we take too much of a react, criminal justice system is the essence of a reactionary system, right? But we have the opportunity to be proactive. And when we talk about um, reentry and we talk about criminal justice, there's implications well beyond the individuals who come to our system. Like we, I talk all the time about, we have you know, about 48,000 people in, in Pennsylvania prisons, they have 81,000 children. Those children are gonna be impacted by what we do with their individual while they're with us and what happens when they leave. And so I think really our challenge is that we have a system that's designed to deliver something uh, a lot less than what we actually are asked to deliver. And then we haven't gotten over ourselves to the point where we're connecting with community infrastructure uh, who already knows how to do it uh, better than we do. One of, the, one of the things, one of the common threads that, that we see run through effective correctional programming is a continuum of care. And, and this kind of um, dovetails a little bit with what John was just talking about. But 
I think it's important that that we that we within prison systems enable those from the community to, to, to come in and work with those in the inmate population. But I think at, a, at an even broader level, I think that there needs to be a greater emphasis on providing programming that that does deliver a continuum of care. And what and what I mean by that is is we begin programming when an individual is in prison, but then we continue that programming after he or she gets released from prison. Uh, when we consider employment programming, for example, we've seen just based on research that, that we've done in Minnesota that when someone participates in prison labor that it produces some, some decent outcomes. Um, it, its impact on recidivism is, is modest at best. Uh, we also see that when individuals participate in employment programming delivered exclusively in the community, like a work release program, it, it also produces some decent outcomes. But again, the, the reduction in recidivism we see is relatively modest. Uh, but Minnesota also has an employment program that starts about 90 days before an individual gets released, and then it continues for up to one year after release. And the, the best outcomes we've observed have been for, uh, uh, for that program, because it does provide this continuum of service delivery from the institution to the community. That's a finding that's been shown with other types of interventions, such as substance abuse treatment. So I just think that, that if, that there are many challenges that prison systems face in producing good outcomes, but I think that that's one that, that deserves a greater focus. Sure. Can I jump on sure. that? The, the employment thing, I think, is, is the essence of an opportunity to really partner with community partners. And, and for the first time in my career, I got to tell you, the business sector is reaching out to corrections looking for partnerships because unemployment's so low, they're looking for employees. So I think it really provides an opportunity. And I'm not alone. There's other states who are experiencing the same thing. But I think it's an illustration of, of where we should be working across systems. We were fortunate enough to get a Department of Ed grant three years ago, uh, a Pathways to Work uh, grant, about a million dollar grant. And that really put us on a journey to, to really start plugging into the workforce infrastructure and getting out of our own way and, and partnering with other agencies. And we've had some, there's some really exciting potentials. One of them we're working on is matriculation agreements with all the community colleges in Pennsylvania. And what that would look like is we, we deliver about 90 different vocational programs, some of which are um, making license plates, because uh, somebody needs to do that, but many of which are uh, marketable job skills that translate to the community. And we have good staff, who are certified to teach these courses, but they're just a certificate. But if we can do a matriculation agreement with a community college that they actually get college credits and it translates, that puts somebody on a path to getting a degree that means something. I can tell you we're working on, on things like um, there's a, a, gonna be a shortage of people who do water and sewage treatment, right? The average age in Pennsylvania, someone who does that is 55. So through this process, we've learned that this is an opportunity for certain individuals who come through our system, and, and we easy want to go to paint by numbers and, oh, so-and-so can't do that. I, listen, I have 47,000 people. Exclude whatever charges you want. There's going to be somebody left, and we can train them how to clean water. You know what I mean? So this, this has really been an exciting opportunity. I think education is such a, such a key place, and we were fortunate to be one of the states that are part of the, the Pell experiment. And I've sat in a bunch of those college classrooms, and not only is it a great learning environment, not only do the college professors beg to teach classes inside my prison versus in the classroom at the university. I won't name the universities because I don't want to make anybody angry, but I, but I got to tell you that this is a real opportunity for us to, to rebuild individuals and put them in a, in a place with the opportunity to be productive citizens. And I think that's the key and that's the focus. And again, uh, employment is a, a very natural place where we can work across um, entities and divisions and even levels of government and really do good things and getting somebody an opportunity to be successful. So uh, I love that, John. I, I agree with you. Um, but we have to be um, cautious about our issue around employment, right? Because folks can get a job. We can get folks jobs. I know that from, from overseeing state parole in California. We can get them a job. The problem is, is can they keep that job? 
So when their car breaks down and they can't get to work and they're late, you and I have the resources, most of us do, to figure out how to get to work. They don't, they quit, they fall back, they go, they go backwards. So I think in, in these partnerships that we're engaging in, I think most uh, jurisdictions are engaging in partnerships with employers. What we've been doing in LA County is adding a support mechanism to those employers so that when uh, Bob or, or Jody or Susie gets a job in those jurisdictions, there is a mentor associated with that engagement because it's easy to quit. If you've had a lifetime experience of giving up and quitting and, and when you're frustrated turning to addiction, it's easy to give up. The folks need more than just, they need jobs, they need education, but they also need that social safety net. And John uh, mentioned this earlier, really engaging with people, and I don't think you said it this directly, but I think this is what you meant, engaging with people that have been in our system as partners with us bringing in ex-lifers as partner. I mean, that freaks people out, right? Ex-lifers into the prison, they're gonna bring in drugs. No, they're really not. Um, what they're gonna do is to help mentor people along the way. So employment, they've gotta have living wage, meaningful jobs. Getting somebody a, uh, a, a low wage job, no health benefits, it's not gonna su sustain. And doing it without those other soft skills around them, whether it's money management or some mentorship role, I think if we really want to push it to the next level, it's got to be a package approach uh, towards uh, employment. And also, you ought to be willing to hire ex-offenders. And so if your state, I, I'm in LA County, very progressive county, the Board of Supervisors expectation is that we hire people that have been in the criminal justice system. So you got to kind of cook the food you want other people to eat, and you got to eat it yourself, right? Don't be afraid to hire people that have been in the system. Not somebody that just left prison yesterday, right? They've got to demonstrate uh, that they've got some, some earned pathway. But we've got to have the courage to say we're a second chance, third chance employer ourselves. I also wanted to say something real quick about jobs, but a little different back to what John was talking about um, in terms of creating these partnerships within the different systems, because I think this is something worth sharing. It should be fairly easy for other systems to replicate. Obviously, we know that getting a job is one of the things that actually helps people. If it is something that will support them, it will have an impact on recidivism. But what we have struggled with in the Bureau is people are housed all over the country and could be going somewhere other than the state in which they are incarcerated. So when we put people through some of our more intensive work programs, which would be the apprenticeship programs, those are hundreds of hours long and they are the same apprenticeship programs that one would take in the community to get a certification. We'd been offering those at the state level. We were able to partner with the Federal Department of Labor to create an agreement where now the people that complete those apprenticeships will get a federal level certification. So their job certification will travel with them wherever they go in the country, which allows them to be mobile, which in today's society most people are. And that was a relatively easy partnership with a very open to working with corrections agency that I, I think others could also try out. Um, I want to sort of, uh transition the conversation here. And one of the important things that I think that I've learned as being the director of the National Institute of Justice is that there are some corrections departments, uh, some state corrections agencies that are actually standing out among the others. And two of them are here today with Minnesota and Pennsylvania. So these questions are directed, this question is directed to uh, John and Grant, but how are you using data and science to guide decision-making decision in your agencies? Yeah, you know, everything we do is, is data-driven. Like when people say, um, you know, what's the benefit of using uh, research to guide what you do? It's like saying, what's the benefit of using air to breathe to me? Uh, I mean, there's really no difference. I mean, the reality is we don't have unlimited resources. Um, so the notion that we would do anything without measuring it and adjusting I, I couldn't imagine another field that would do that. I mean, if, you, if your doctor was, was um, making diagnoses based on a guess and not measuring his outcomes, um, you'd find a new doctor. And, and so to me, it's, it's just as, as natural as anything. I even got scammed into doing random control trials by Brett Buckland 
uh, who's in the room here. I mean, if we're going to do something new, I would guarantee you that if, if it's at all possible, we'll be uh, assigning people randomly and, and measuring it and with a relatively quick turnaround time to figure out if it's even kind of viable before we move forward. I'm certainly not uh, in, in an era where we have competing interests and we have competing funding and uh, I'm not going to do anything that I don't have some assurance uh, that it's going to be effective. So I, I can't imagine not having data or not using data on anything. I can tell you in 2012, I think it was 2012, we, we became the, the first system to do performance contracts on all our halfway houses. Uh, and, and it stunned me that in 2012, the notion of doing performance, like we're paying people, uh, probably our spend was $100 million, and the notion that 2012 was the first time that we decided we're gonna see if we actually get outcomes from this expenditure is stunning to me. I, I can't imagine why <clears throat> any field, but especially ours, with what we have at stake, with the lives that are in our hands, with the, listen, reentry is difficult. There's reasons why the outcomes are, are not good. I mean, people graduate from college and do bad things, right? Of course, we don't get to pick, and, and colleges select who comes there. Uh, we don't. So the notion that we're going to be asked to do this difficult task uh, with all the different uh, challenges that individuals who come through our system have, and we would do that blindly without measuring and adjusting. Like, this is not a pass-fail deal for us. This is a measure, adjust, measure, adjust, measure, adjust, and hopefully we can continue to get better as we adjust. So uh, over the last decade, we, we have conducted and published more than a dozen or more than two dozen program evaluations and research studies. And because we, we think it's important to ensure that the, the quality of our work is high, we, we do publish those in, in peer-reviewed academic journals. Um, just because one of the things that, uh, that we hear is, is Oh, well, well, this is just going to affect practice or policy. This doesn't need to get published in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm like, this is a, absolutely the reason why it has to go through the peer-reviewed process, um, because it matters. It, it affects lives. And uh, so some of the, some of the findings that, that we have produced have, have resulted in an impact in our policy and practice based on some of our evaluations of chemical dependency treatment and sex offender treatment. Our Minnesota state legislature, uh, to their credit, increased funding to, to expand uh, treatment capacity within Minnesota's prison system. Uh, there have been other programmatic changes that, that we have made uh, uh, in response to, to the findings from program evaluations. But one thing that's been important to convey is that research, at least from an agency's perspective, is, it's not just propaganda or at least it shouldn't be. It's much, much more valuable than that. In fact, some of the best evaluations, in my view, are those negative evaluations where you find that it doesn't work. And just because something doesn't work doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It goes back to program fidelity, that, that maybe there were issues with the way that, that the program was implemented. In fact, we, we did a study several years ago where, where we evaluated this program called Moving On which is a gender responsive uh, CBT for, for the female population. And in the first seven or eight years that it was implemented, it, it, was, it was implemented with fidelity. And we saw good recidivism outcomes when it was implemented with fidelity. But then uh, in 2010 or 2011, staff there decided to make some changes to it and, and tried to offer the light version of this program to a much larger number of individuals, and it no longer had an impact on recidivism. And so, um, so when 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 we had those findings, then it was it was clear to to our staff, you need to go back to the way that that you were running that program. And so, uh, using data and science, it it does it absolutely matters. And I will say that the leadership at the Minnesota DOC, again to their credit, that they that they have tried to pay attention to that. I still don't think we're as evidence-based as, as we think we are, um, 
but I do think that, that there is an effort to, to try to be data driven. And, and even when it comes to, to risk assessment, that, that we've, uh, Minnesota DOC, we've developed uh, automated uh, recidivism risk assessments for our own population. And that's really an effort to try to use data and science to, to improve the way that, that we prioritize and deliver programming to the inmate population. Let me, let me just um, kind of try to push us beyond just like traditional research. So we were fortunate enough to partner with a group called BetaGov maybe five years ago now. It's, it seems like forever. And um, what they do, they come in and partner with us and they take ideas from staff and inmates and turn them into testable short-term trials. And, and to your point, as far as learning what works and what doesn't work, we've had some remarkable stuff. And, and first of all, if we weren't doing research around it, some of it I would have never signed off on. You know, unfortunately, some of it doesn't come to us. But I, I'll just give you two kind of illustrations. One, we did a, a pilot around. We had, uh, obviously, we have, sometimes we have folks who try to smuggle drugs in business. So we thought, hey, let's send notice out to folks and tell them of the implications of the uh, of what happens if they bring drugs in. It sounds like a good idea. It sounds like a real corrections, criminal justice stuff. Didn't work. Um, didn't inc didn't increase cost us postage, right? But didn't didn't really have any effect. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in some cases, the the actual amount of drugs that came in those facilities went up, right? I'm not saying it's causal, right? <laughs> easy, easy, big guy. Correlation, not causation. I got you. Um, but conversely, we did some stuff like. Let individuals choose um, what color sheets they had in the restrictive housing unit, something I would have never signed off on. Um, and what it turns out is that every trial we do where an individual has choice has a positive effect. So I, it doesn't have to be uh, pie in the sky. I mean, one of my frustrations with research is don't tell me what uh, three years from now that something's not working when I funded it for three years, okay? Oh, almost slipped there. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't tell me that. That does not work for me. This is an environment where I have to go in and fight for every dollar, and I want to spend dollars to improve people's lives, but I don't want to waste money. So this notion of, of short-term measuring, and it starts with having good baseline data across, uh, across everywhere. And, and uh, that's, I think that's really step one for us. Like Every facility should know what their uh, violence rate is and what their assaults on staff are. And so if we're gonna try new things, and we encourage our facilities to try new things. We've taken ceasefire from the outside, brought it inside, and had some good effect with that. We've taken swift, certain, and fair. And actually, we're getting ready to scale that system-wide. So we had a facility, SCI Somerset, and a superintendent who's now one of my deputy secretaries, who, who said, let's try this swift, uh, certain, and fair inside prisons. It had great outcomes. Now, truth be told, we did a bunch of places that had mixed outcomes, but we were able to figure out what the magic sauce was. And, and in the next six months, we're going to scale that system wide. But it all came from trial, error, understanding if something works, why it didn't work, and then making adjustments. Hmm. I guess from, from the moving on from talking about prisons, I'd like to ask Terry, on the local level, uh, with community corrections, but also in jails. Um, what, what are you seeing as the innovations, the next steps in moving this subset of corrections forward? I think there's a whole bunch going on at the local level. Frankly, uh, probation's been more progressive around reentry than most of your traditional corrections folks. I've, I've evolved in my thinking around reentry from the time I worked in prisons. Uh, I, I think uh, risk and needs assessments, that's, everybody kind of knows that. I don't think that there's miracle science behind that anymore. I think folks get it. I think understanding how to do diversion on the front end, whether it's mental health diversion, Los Angeles County, for example, has specialized courts that do mental health diversion on the front end. I, I was telling the story a little bit earlier today, uh, Twin Towers Correctional Facility in Los Angeles is the largest mental health treatment facility in America. It's got 4,000 acutely mentally ill people. And so when I first walked the tiers of that facility, uh, you would see people in really uh, a deep uh, mental health crises and it's like, what kind of crime are these people committing? I pulled one gentleman, he had been locked up like 50 times, 
all nuisance crime kind of stuff. The last time was defrauding, defrauding an innkeeper, which is essentially he stole some food. So we're criminalizing mental illness, we're criminalizing homelessness and poverty. So thinking differently on the front end about how do you engage your health agencies, your mental health, how do you create diversion opportunities working with the courts and the public defender, I think is the way of the future. Because if you don't, nothing good really comes from detention. Right? You know, People don't come in there and all of a sudden we work with them, they get better, but even coming in is a traumatizing experience. And if you don't have a progressive system, you're actually teaching people worse behaviors. And understanding that diverting reentry, that is better public safety. If you reduce recidivism, you've reduced victims. So at, at the county level, uh, also Los Angeles County Jails does a ton of programming inside the jail. They have gender responsive uh, uh, pods uh, where we work with outside agencies to come in to design that program. You hire experts like John says, right? I mean, just because I read a research paper does not mean I'm an expert in that lane. And I do read a lot of research papers. So working with our community, engaging people that were previously incarcerated, bringing the CBOs, the community-based organizations, doing in-reach in, so it's creating a network outside. Amazing things have happened in juvenile justice in the state of California. And you're saying, well, what's that have to do with the locals? Um, about uh, in 2006 in California, they did juvenile justice realignment. You probably have heard a whole bunch about uh, AB 109 or public safety realignment for the adults. But in 2006, there were 10,000 young people in state detention facilities. The, the state decided to fund and incentivize the local probation departments to keep young people at the local level rather than moving them upstream to the state juvenile justice system. Uh, at the time, LA County, we had about 5,000 young people in detention at the time. Uh, California had about 10,000. So when, when Cal I was with California at the time, started saying, hey, counties, keep these young people because you do a better job at the local level for all the reasons that John said. Because we're not plucking them from LA and shipping them up to Susanville six hours away. We keep them right there where their families are. So anyway, in California, the state incentivized local probation to do diversion on the front end. Today, in the state juvenile justice system, there's less than 700 young people. That's a reduction of over 9,000 young people in state detention. One third of all of the state's workload comes to LA County. LA County is a state, right? I mean, we are <laughs> massive. Uh, we're bigger than, than in Pennsylvania, I think. I don't know. We're probably pretty close. You better knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway, at the time, I told you we had 5,000. So if 9,000 were in the state, we get a third. You would assume you add that 3,000 to my 5,000, I'd have 8,000 young people in detention today. I have, I have about 1,000 young people in detention today. So front-end diversion, rather than bringing kids into detention because they won't go to school, because they're truant, because they jumped on a subway, work in a different way with them. Keeping them community-based organizations, work with the families, work with the families, work with the families, and whatever family is for that young person, right? And then anywhere that you can disrupt the trajectory inward. If you're, if you're terrorizing the community and you're violent, there's a place for you. The prison doors are open. I'm not talking about that group. I'm talking about your drug addicts, your mentally ill, your young people that are acting out in gangs because of, because of trauma, maybe because their parents in prison, maybe because their parents addicted. That's what LA County Probation's doing, and that's not new to probation, to be frank with you. Probation's been in that lane across America for a long time. All right, thank you. I got a question now for Alex. Um, how does the BOP measure the success of their programs? Thank you. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say we, we will have a very nuanced answer for that. Um, recidivism is certainly an important measure of program success if the program is designed to impact recidivism. So we've got our research office folks right here in the front row. Hi, guys. Um, and we do have some programs that we can cite data that shows that they are successful at improving reentry outcomes. But we 
also allow for there to be other measures of success. Like, let's look at a fitness program, say. It would probably be very hard to take a fitness program, even a really good, solid, evidence-based fitness program, and tie that to somebody's reentry success. Maybe one person, sure, but across the board and say, aha, everybody that does this really amazing fitness program does way better in community outcomes long term. But if that same fitness program makes people healthier, makes them less overweight, less at risk for disease processes, that's still good. Um, and that still is a success of that program. So we recognize that people are whole and we do the recidivism piece um, with things like our federal prison industries, which is our trade name Unicor, our businesses, or our education programs, or our residential drug abuse program. But we also measure mental health improvement time in general population, being able to take advantage of some of these programs that I just referenced, healthy or more regular family connections, um, and even becoming more informed citizens so that they can take advantage of opportunities in the community when they release. Good. I got one question I want to throw out to the panel is that often I think that corrections uh, across the country there are some departments, some state departments, that appear to be afraid to evaluate their programs, afraid to find failure. Uh, so my question is, what if you can find that gem, that success that you need to invest in uh, is almost as important, uh, or probably most the most important thing you can do? And so some of the times what I've seen in some of the states I've visited uh, in the past year is that there are some state facilities that are offering a whole host of programs that they should be offering. But there's no tie into evaluating whether or not the programs work. So for this panel, what can you offer as advice to, say, David Mulhausen, who just became the director of a state correctional facility, what, can, what advice can you give to not be afraid of analyzing data that can actually help you in the long term deliver better services and hopefully lower recidivism rates? Well, I'll start. Um, so I think the, the first reality is they understand that, that corrections directors work in a political construct, right? So the easy thing to do is not measure. And that's that, perhaps it's a smart thing to do unless you measure early so you can blame it on the previous person. Um, I think that's the reality of it. I mean, the median time in this job is two years. So uh, when I go sit around a table with corrections directors, I've never been in a meeting six months apart that the same people were sitting around the table. So I think that's just a, a, a truism of, of the political construct that this works in. But uh, and kind of joking, but kind of not joking. I think it's early, early on, it's critical that, that you establish a baseline. And, um, and we have not really been held to account for outcomes historically. Um, but again, when you're talking about competing interests and competing money and when you're talking about the number of lives we're going to touch, I think it's the only way to do things. And I've, I've seen an evolution. Um, but, but I also, um, I think the other political construct is that when you're talking about um, elected officials, long-term thinking is off in the next election. So in more than 50% of the people, we're talking two years out. So this notion on, of return on investment uh, down the road is often absent uh, in, the, in the discussion. So what I would, the advice I would give is, first of all, you have to have a good research shop, and you have to have a good understanding. And then secondly, and probably most importantly, you have to be able to tell the nuanced story that is a correction system. Like, you have to be able to describe things in a manner that people can understand and, and describe why it's important to measure and why it's not a pass-fail. It's a, a pass or fail and then adjust. So why should state prison systems in, uh, have research shops? I think, well, a lot of them don't. I mean, that, that's one thing that's, that's worth pointing out, and it may surprise some people, is that some state prison systems don't have what most would consider to be research and evaluation shops. And so I think the first step would simply have to be invest in a research and evaluation shop. Um, but I think even, 
I think I think the bigger issue though is that a lot of state prison populations that even even though they've been declining over the last decade, I mean for for years they were increasing. And so when when your your first and only priority is to find prison beds for those for that influx who are entering or re-entering the system, research is a luxury. You, wh why do we even have to worry about, about research when we have this other immediate pressing priority? Um, but I think, as John mentioned, that, that research is, is kind of looking at things from, uh, from the long view. And, and do we want better outcomes uh, five years from now, 10 years from now? And I think in order to get there, you, you do have to invest in, in research and evaluation resources to get there. Let me just follow up on that real John quick. John and I are fighting over yeah. buttons. <laughs> As usual, right? <laughs> um, you, you know, I think sometimes we, we hear research and we think like the ivory tower and, and measuring uh, programs and all this stuff. But I, but I got to tell you that um, I think that, that a lot of corrections directors don't understand what a powerful tool um, using data to guide policy is. And recently, uh, we just came off a lockdown where we had a significant drug issue. Uh, you mentioned synthetics, and we had a bunch of think synthetics coming in. And I can tell you that, that the data case is what, what won the day and what led us to the changes we made. And, and absent having a data orientation, I'm not sure we would have got where we got to. And, and what I'll tell you is the month before, uh, our historic positive random drug test rate's about 0.32. And the month before we did the lockdown, that number jumped to 1%. Now, if we didn't know what the random drug tests were, that we... we be difficult to make the case, right, that we really had a drug problem. And some people, even with that, said, it's only 1%. And I said, well, it's a closed system. Like, 1% is pretty high, you know. Um, but, <clears throat> but so we went through these changes, and we were able to, to put a measure, a baseline measure, on everything we anticipated. And it's a discipline that we force our staff to do. If you want to do something new, that's fine. What's the anticipated outcome? Yeah, sometimes the outcome is not recidivism. I mean, we had a problem with increase in violence among uh, younger inmates. And I approached our, our research folks, and this is at a time when we had an embedded researcher funded by NIJ, which is a great program, by the way. You may want to think about expanding that one. Um, but we had an embedded researcher. And, and so the challenge I said to my research folks is, listen, it's clear to me that when we get too many young inmates at the same site, um, violence goes up. What can we do about this? Long story short, four years later, I believe, we worked with the uh, Lehigh Industrial uh, Engineering Program and developed an algorithmic-based inmate move system that allowed us to make good, nuanced decisions, and we saw a reduction in violence as, as a byproduct of that. So I think oftentimes folks in, in my position don't see research as a management tool. Um, and sometimes we focus on violence and this and that, but, but it is the tool for all that stuff. Sorry. I always love listening to John. I learned so much. Uh, uh, corrections is an art and a science, right? I, it, I, I am an expert in corrections. It's not based on the fact I worked a tier a long time ago. It's based on the fact I pay attention to the research. California Department of Corrections has 50 researchers on staff. Uh, I've watched it ebb and flow over time about the willingness to allow outside researchers. Because much like John said, some people value it and they're afraid of it, some people don't. I honestly think to be effective in these jobs, you have to not need a job. Right? I can speak the way I want to speak because if somebody didn't like the way I spoke, they can exit me stage left or stage right, which makes me a little bit more willing to, to be brave. But what I expect my employees to do, because John and I, we come and go. Somebody else will sit on this panel three years from now. What you have to do is to push the philosophy about corrections as an art and as a science down to the DNA of the organization. So as John says, don't let just somebody come to you and say, Violence is up because we were serving spaghetti yesterday, right? Really? Well, let's see how many times we've served spaghetti over the last year, and let's see whether or not violence was up each of those days. Maybe there was new drugs in, maybe it was Pruno, maybe somebody kicked somebody's shoes that day. I think you have to have the, the, the courage uh, to make the uh, decision to do research. Researchers have to be responsible with research. 
So oftentimes people will come and say, hey, listen, uh, Terry, we'd like to do some research on blah, blah, but that research entity hasn't proven to be responsible with their research. They have an agenda on the front end. Having relationships with universities that you can call on them for independent research and pushing your your public agency, your legislature, your board of supervisor, whoever it is, to ensure that you have actual data sets that you can research. I think you'll find that's very difficult at the local level. Most state systems have pretty progressive systems. But you get to a, a, a county jail system, for example, they may not have a lot of infrastructure to actually align themselves with research. But I think if we want to say we are a profession, that's an art and science, that research comes hands in hands with that. And as John says, you gotta be a risk taker, right? You're not gonna hit a home run if you don't swing the bat. Now, I am a Dodgers fan today, I'm a little bereft. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should have swung the bat a little bit better. Um, but I think, I think you have to be willing to swing the bat and you're gonna hit some home runs and you're gonna strike out and then, and then our bosses have to, be, um, have to be patient with our audacious and courageous risk taking, responsible. Um, and then use research to, to adjust quickly and don't wait for that three-year research. You've got to kind of deal with promising practices on the front end. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. I would like to transition at this point and take qu questions from the audience and also from WebEx. We have three microphones uh, to my right, the center, and the left. Um, so please stand up and say your name and affiliation and ask a question. Thank you. There we go. I think it's on. Where's our sound guy? Yeah, unmute me. We're working on it. Did you get it? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. My name's John Stannard. I do uh, criminal justice reform work for the Church of Scientology's national office in D.C. I'm also on the board of a, pr of a prison program, reentry uh, in uh, inside the jail program called Criminon. And I love the discussion that I've heard today. Uh, uh, Mr. Wenzel talked a little bit about um, how the, the institutions need to be friendly for outside programs coming in. So uh, I, I was a volunteer for our program in DC jail for about six years and have a lot of experiences there. And so I've got two questions for you guys. Number one, um, I've always found that the management uh, within the jail was very receptive to you know, our group and many other groups coming in. But the implementation, once we got on there, was a little spotty. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how you pull that together. Secondly, I'd be interested in everyone's thoughts here regarding the value of faith-based programming within the institutions and what your institutions are doing with faith-based groups coming in. Thank you. I can tell you a little bit about what we do in the Bureau of Prisons in terms of faith-based programming to that piece of your question. Um, the Bureau has faith-based volunteers at every one of our 122 facilities around the country representing a wide variety of religions. We have individual practitioners who worship, so we have chapels in every facility. Um, and people can go use resource libraries, meet with chaplains either of their own faith or participate in various programming at their own speed. There are book clubs and groups that study religious texts in the chapels. But then there are two levels of actual formal programming. One is a residential program and then one is less residential, but a similar program offered on more of an outpatient, if you will, basis. Um, and those are called Threshold and Life Connections. They are faith-based reentry programs that are open to individuals who wish to choose from any of a variety of faiths, and then they will be provided mentors to make sure that they're working through the program, but also honoring the tenets of their individual faith. So, uh Within the Minnesota DOC, uh, we, we have evaluated uh, a program back then, it was called uh, Interfaith Freedom Initiative, or IFI, which is run by uh, Prison Fellowship, and now it's called Prison, Prison Fellowship Academy. Uh, when we evaluated it, we, we found that it did uh, produce a reduction in recidivism. 
And one of the questions then was, well, is it, is it the faith part that reduced recidivism or was it something else? And, and it's difficult to really disentangle that because what we see with a lot of faith-based programming is that, that those who, who, have greater, who have greater religious involvement are more likely to volunteer. And so those faith-based programs tend to attract more volunteers. And so those volunteers come in from the community and they also provide support after individuals get released. And so they provide this pro-social support that is critical because one thing that a lot of people forget is that antisocial peers is a major recidivism risk factor. So when individuals come in and whether this is prison visitation or mentorship or even something like faith-based programming, that they're, they're addressing a recidivism risk factor in addition to potentially some other recidivism risk factors. And I've been involved with, with other research where we looked at a Bible college in Angola, and that's kind of outside the scope of this. But, but generally speaking, what we do see is that, you know, with faith-based programs, that, that there is that social support piece that, that is critical. I, I find volunteer programs to be some of the more transformative uh, things I've seen um, I think the fact that uh, when people come in and, and volunteer their time to invest in someone's life who they're not being paid or reimbursed to do, I think, I think uh, individuals who are incarcerated really, I think it resonates with them, and they're very popular programs for us. As far as the, uh, the cultural stuff with, with staff, um, I, I think um, that it's all about a value proposition. I think we're all the same that if we see a value in something, and, and not just a, like this uh, high value for the society, but how does it benefit me? And I think from a correctional leadership standpoint, I think um, that's important to message. That, listen, these programs keep individuals productively occupied, really encourage uh, appropriate behavior, and, and as a line correctional officer, you benefit from that. Um, and, I, and I also tell volunteers all the time, and we, we really go out of our way to acknowledge volunteers. We do an um, annual ceremony at each one of our prisons, and we do a statewide one and because uh, we think it's very an important part of the fiber of, of our organization. Um, but what I also tell volunteers is it's okay to say hi to staff, too. Like, it's a two-way street, right? I think um, if you put 10 people in the room, one of them's going to be a jerk, and I think that formula goes over every group we deal with, right? And so I, I encourage people, when you have that bad interaction, understand that's one in 10, right? Let's focus on, on the other ones. But I think it's a, it's a very important part of it. And then when you talk about reentering, you talk about community connections. When you talk about pro-social supports and those kinds of things, plugging individuals into positive faith communities upon reentry, that's good stuff. I don't, John, I don't know if you're gonna remember this. John and I were at a, some event where we were uh, recommending awards for research grants. And Dr. Ed Latessa, some of you may know him or know his name out of University of Cincinnati. Um, I asked him the question, what's, what's emerging? What's, you know, we all know R&R, &R, we got it. What's new, right? What's, what's on cutting edge? And what he said is he believes that the role of mentorship uh, will play a, uh, play a significant role in the emerging research about how does that in-reach mentorship, faith-based does that, um, and then that aftercare release mentorship, how does that drive down um, uh, future criminality? I also agree with John that, that folks have to understand the conditions in which our employees work. They're hyper alert, they're hyper diligent, these are tough jobs. And so saying hi, saying what can I do for you, having a relationship with the staff will do far more than me coming in and having a, a meeting with you know, 400 employees and saying I value people coming from the outside. Uh, be value added, and, and, and if you're encountering an employee who is that one jerk, don't engage in the code of silence around that behavior, right? Let somebody know so that management can, can do some CBT work with the employee. All right. All right. Um, next question, please. Pat Marks, United Methodist Women. My question is not faith-based. My question springs off of what Ms. McDonald said about the foster care system, and um, our focus is on the school-to-prison pipeline. And our question is how to disrupt that with, how do we get the juvenile system working with the Child Protective Services 
system? Sure. Um, much like we've been mentioning here today is that law enforcement has stepped into a lane where other systems are not holding up their end of the bargain, whether that's uh, families or schools or religious institutions or mental health or drug treatment. Uh, all of a sudden in America, you know, more and more badges came into place and fewer and fewer social workers came into place. I think understanding um, that our schools need support to deal with kids that are coming from, young people that are coming from very difficult neighborhoods. Every state has uh, urban settings uh, with high poverty, high violence, high crime. And those schools exist in those areas. And if the solution is uh, call the school police when Johnny's acting up and not understanding the trauma that Johnny lives in, all of a sudden they're in the juvenile justice system and on a pathway there. We have a, a profound relationship with our Department of uh, Youth and Family Services because we have many kids who are in both systems, right? But what I will tell you uh, we struggle with as leaders is the push off. It's not my kid, it's your kid, it's DCF kid. DCF, no, no, it's not my kid, it's a probation kid. I long for the day when we fight over the kid. No, give me this kid, I'm gonna help this kid. No, you give me the kid, I'm gonna help the kid, right? We, we actually, in LA County, I had probation staff that were supervising kids in the schools, not on formal probation. They called it voluntary probation, right? I'm not in the voluntary probation business, right? I'm not out looking, broadening my net, scooping up people to come to my system. What I said is let's stop this voluntary probation system and use those dollars to leverage dollars for the school. Because what it costs me for a probation officer in a school, a school can hire a, a, co a coach and a social worker, right? And then that kid has not had a, 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 a personal identity of being supervised by probation. So I think we need to talk a whole lot about what leads to that pathway into the juvenile justice system. And if somebody's not going to school, why aren't they going to school? Don't just arrest them, give them truancy, and all of a sudden they're mine. That's not the right solution to the problem. Let me, um, so, so I'll just kind of briefly um, talk kind of my journey to, to this. And, and my answer is always upstream and, and proactive, uh, you know, not backstream and reactive. So in, in 2014, we did an initiative called A Time to Lead. Uh, which kind of replicated uh, President Obama's My Brother's Keeper, uh, Governor Corbett, um, My Brother's Keeper, we would not have called that in Pennsylvania in 2014, so we call it time to leave, but we looked at, at outcomes around uh, young men of color, and what we found is that a, a young black kid who dropped out of school had a 70% lifetime likelihood of being incarcerated. All right, and, and so what we also know is that kids who are not reading at, at grade level by third grade are likely to drop out. So. Um, to me, it's just as simple uh, as keeping kids in school. So then looking at what does that, you know, early childhood education programs from nurse family partnership to, to high quality pre-K and those kinds of things, I really think is where it's at. I think we really need to be proactive. And we know right now, if you overlay outcomes in areas that have high crime, they also have high unemployment, they have poor education outcomes. Well, it, when we do heat maps around these things, everything is in the same area. So what, I'll tell you what we did in Pennsylvania. We decided to be more proactive and we created uh, through legislation what's called the First Chance Trust Fund. And what that does, that puts a 1% surcharge on every contract with Department of Corrections over $5 million. And that 1% goes to programs specifically to impact kids in, in high crime areas. All right, you would think it wouldn't be controversial. It got a little controversial um, but we ended up getting it through uh, through the budget process. But the notion there is that we know that that kids in certain zip codes have a challenging environment. But we have an opportunity to be proactive and put pro-social supports before they ever hit the criminal justice system. Like we need to get out of using this lens of the criminal justice system uh, to address these things and be more proactive in front end. And education, I mean, it, it, we're not splitting the atom here. All right, um, the, the, our, our first chance trust fund seeks to fund programs like Boys and Girls Club and Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Uh, I will tell you every year I do three uh, pre-K events outside of my prisons uh, where we invite providers and community people and we talk about um, 
trying to get beyond the next election and think about funding these programs proactively uh, to put kids in a posture where they can be successful. I mean, think the high bar that we want kids to be able to read at, at grade level, at third grade. I mean, so I think it's, I really want to push us out of the criminal justice system for some of this stuff and just fund systems that we know work and, and fund it in a way that we can get these kids on track. Let me add to that. If you go to your uh, juvenile halls and camps in your jurisdiction, uh, I can assure you they're going to be disproportionately young people of color. Los Angeles County, uh, I would say 90% of the young people in detention are young people of color. So it's not, it's not just the school issue, it's the criminal justice decisions around folks, uh, young people, uh, that take a look at, am I making decisions based on implicit bias of the color of people's skin? Uh, because it is alarming. If you, if you, uh, went, if we all left here today and we went and watched the arraignment court here in Washington D.C., you will see 95% of the people are are African American, I believe. That's, I think somewhere around there. So I think disproportionality. Our schools underinvested in in high need communities. Uh, we have to do a better job. And the truth of the matter is, if we really wanted to reduce state prison populations, Federal Bureau of Prison population, you would push that money down like John's talking about, down to the front, the very beginning of it, to stem the tide of what comes behind uh, these problematic communities. Next question. Hello. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Monique Riley. I work for the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General in the Evaluations and Inspections Division. So I am not new to research. I appreciate this panel today. Um, I think that one of the main things that I loved about listening to the discussion today was that you guys talked a lot about changing the narrative about how we deliver criminal justice services. Um, you, Terry, talked about being courageous in talking about um, accountability, looking different for each person and each crime. Uh, I really appreciate that, so I wanted to start first by saying that. But my question is about um, prison programs for reentry. Uh, for inmates with shorter sentences versus inmates with longer sentences. Uh, we know that prison programs work and have good outcomes for uh, that are much longer um, just because they get to stay in the program longer. But at the state, federal, and local levels, how have we been changing reentry services so that people with shorter sentences can receive some of those same benefits? So I, I can go ahead and start with that one. Um, I think one, one thing that, that's worth emphasizing at the outset is that for those who, who come into prison and have short stays, they are much more likely to be warehoused. They're much more likely to go into prison and not do anything, just sit there idle for the whole time. That, that produces bad outcomes all the way around. And so... What, what you see is that some states have, have tried to reduce, uh, and well, those who, who stay for short periods of time are more likely to come into prison as either a probation violator or as a parole violator. And so you, what, what we've seen is a number of states have tried to reduce the number of admissions for probation and parole violators, uh, which I think is a step in the right direction. But it's, it's difficult, though, to provide effective programming to those who, who are in prison for, th for three or four months. Because what we see even with an effective intervention like a cognitive behavioral therapy uh, program, that, that's going to last at least 90 days. Uh, and most effective correctional programs do take longer than that. And I think that it, that's a consideration that we need to, uh, to keep in mind when, when we're deciding how long someone should be in prison. And, and so sometimes when people hear that, they think, oh, well, we just need to, to make prison longer for everybody. <laughs> Not exactly. What, what needs to happen is that we, we need to reduce those short stays in prison. So instead of someone coming in for 90 days, maybe it's 150 or 180, but at the same time on the back end, that for someone who's in prison for 10 years, that should be ample time to participate in programming. And what benefit do we really get if someone's in prison in year eight or year nine or year 10? And instead focusing more on getting those individuals out of prison and not warehousing them. 
I would just like to point out that I think this is where your halfway house or what we call residential reentry centers can really come into play because I agree with most of what you said. When people are in for a very short time, some of these programs are just designed to be longer. So while the Bureau does offer shorter workshop versions of things that people can take when they don't have the time to do it, the reality is treatment is not something that happens overnight. Behavioral change is not something changes in thinking patterns. Those do take time. But Many people releasing out of prison, even if they did return on a violation, which, like you said, are some of the shorter sentences, are going to go to some kind of transitional place, which we call RRCs in the Bureau, but most systems have something similar. Um, and treatment can take place there in a community setting. You can still have those CBT programs, and they can continue often with the person as they move on out of the halfway house and into the community-based services full time. I think this is the perfect group where we really need to, to not paint by numbers and, and prison systems are notoriously um, not agile and we we're notoriously treat everybody the same way. A third of our new court commits have less than a year to serve. We call them short men's and we were apparently one vote away from a good legislative fix, uh, but the session ended so that's not going to happen. Um, but this is a group where I think you have to differentiate and then you have to have a different approach and and both and in that you could st uh, Start services inside and follow them outside. I think this is also a group that's rife uh, Really ripe for something like medication assisted treatment. So we're getting ready to expand and offer all every uh, available medication assisted treatment. The target group is parole violators and short men's or people who come in less than a year. That way we can keep them on the medication throughout and just like everyone else, we're struggling with this opioid epidemic and that, you know, the, our percentage of new commits has doubled from 6% to 12% over the past 10 years. Um, so that's a group that we're gonna specifically target to keep on medication assisted treatment from the time they come in the door out the back door. I think the third, uh, the third truism with this group is this is the most critical group to make sure we keep them as close to home as we can. Now in Pennsylvania, we have a structural bed deficit. So we have 10,000 more inmates from the east than we have um, beds in the east and vice versa in the west. But this group in particular, um, we should be keeping them as close to home as possible and then engaging those community groups so we can create uh, the continuum that we talked about earlier, but keeping them plugged in to their communities when it's appropriate and, and plugged into those supports is, is actually part of the treatment. So uh, prison should be for people you're afraid of, not that you're mad at. If somebody coming into prison for three months, you're not afraid of that person. Right? So the question is, what kind of sen sentencing reform can we do that doesn't let somebody that's got three months left to serve go up to prison. It's the most expensive solution to have a bad outcome, right? You're, processing in a reception center are some of your most expensive beds. Most systems, California Department of Corrections, could take up to 60 days to process somebody through reception. And then to serve 30 more days, how ridiculous is that to bring them upstream? There are all kinds of solutions to that problem, but I think, I think the legislature has to look themselves in the eyes and say, why are we shifting people with 30, 60, 90 days left to serve to the state prison system? In California, a parole violator cannot serve their time in state prison anymore. That parole violators, uh, because of realignment, uh, serve their time in the county jail. But even that's not really a good solution because they go in, they're, throw, they're doing whatever they're doing, they're not getting treatment, they're popping right back out. So I think a fresh-eyed look about how you're using those very valuable state prison beds making different decisions about front-end investments into uh, facilities that you're not afraid of if they escape. You know, I love John. He says medicated assistant therapy. That's drug treatment. It's not prison. So I think, you know, we just do what, what the legislator orders us to do, but I think at a certain point we have to challenge to say, why are the sentencing solutions sending people to prison that really aren't violent. They don't have long periods of time to serve. And what could we do different, and, and what environment could we put people in that has a better solution? Arresting behaviors, not arresting bodies. All right. 
We have one more person to ask a question. If, if that's okay, sure, if there's time, thanks. Um, my name is Jessica Stroop. I'm with the Bureau of Justice Statistics, so the conversation about research has been really beneficial. And to dovetail off of the last question, I was interested in hearing the panel's thoughts. If you know of anything that's happening at your state and local levels that give good out, um, outcome indicators for the short-term stays. I know that one of the things that we struggle with on the research side is figuring out who is eligible for some of our studies, not just in the prison side, but on the jails as well, and struggling with the movement that occurs, particularly in the jails, that oftentimes we are not able to get good research on the pre-adjudicated population because they're moving around so much and just the logistics alone of trying to get some uh, information and research about these folks presents a logistical challenge. So I was wondering if at the state level, if you know of anything that you could share with us that is beneficial that you're able to capture from these populations of these short stays, be it on the prison side or on the jail side, what can we be looking at to see changes um, and, and meaningful data that it can be garnered from these short stays, because that's something that we struggle with, I think, on the national level. So I can, I can go ahead and weigh in on that one. I think, so if I'm interpreting the question correctly, I think some of it is, is um, the, the type of programming that, that we can provide short stay inmates and in, in what... It's not about programming, but it's more about what is effective I'm not sure. Right. Well, I think I think the question seems to assume that that there are possibly good outcomes from short stays, and and I guess and I guess my my argument would be. There, the, the evidence that we've compiled when looking at Minnesota's prison population, and, we, and we've looked at this in depth, is that, we, that, that the outcomes are significantly worse when, when we're looking at, at those who are there for short stays. Um, one of the, that's one of the reasons why we see that, that length of stay is, is positively associated with better outcomes. And again, that's not to say that we need to increase uh, lengths of stay in order to achieve better outcomes, but I do think there's a point at which bringing someone into prison for two months or, th or three months just is not a good idea. It, it's, it, do it, it doesn't achieve any kind of pub good public safety outcome, and I just, I, I think it's wasteful and it's costly, and there, there's a much better way to do prison than that. If the research shows, I don't know if it's 70 or 80 or 60 percent, it depends on who you're asking and what day of the week is, that uh, many people come to enter the system over addiction issues. That's what John mentioned about medicated assistant therapy. The jails may be a, a classic place in which to begin at intake. You know, I always say I'm in the greatest crises uh, and most willing to change the day after a crisis, I mean. So if I, uh, God willing, I had a heart attack today, Tomorrow, I'm not eating cheeseburgers anymore. I'm done with the cheeseburgers. I'm eating salad. I'm going to exercise, all of that. Um, what happens in jails is people come in in crises. You're getting them the worst day in their life. Imagine a world in which, rather than just an intake officer talking to you or a mental health clinician, but a drug treatment counselor is talking to you that when you wake up the next day and say, hey, aren't you tired? Right? Aren't you tired? But jails generally in LA County, uh, the average time for the pretrial population is 13 days. So what can you do in 13 days? You might introduce them to something, but imagine a world that, like John said, medicated assistant therapy is tapped on there as well as an introduction, uh, because we're an uh, ACA state, an introduction into drug treatment center uh, while they're there. I would suggest you connect with the Council of State Governments Justice Center, specifically around the initiative they're doing at Stepping Up, um, where they're crosswalking human service and jail data, specifically around individuals with behavioral health issues. Um, they did one in, in Dauphin County in, in Harrisburg, and they did a real, uh, like a year in a county doing a deep dive into their data and data collection and challenges. So Richard Cho is the head of that. At, and I think that probably the best illustration as far as how to capture really good data around a uh, short-term transient population. And they actually did it in two, two pipes. So the behavioral health 
data and the criminal justice data and crosswalked it. All right, one last question. Um. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Rena Chakraborty. I'm a NIJ practitioner fellow, but I work for the DC Department of Corrections, which is a large municipal jail system. And my question is, um, given that in jails the lengths of stay are so short, um, how good of a measure do you think recidivism actually is for measuring the success of outcomes of people who we have in our custody and who may or may not receive programming? And a follow-up would be, do you have alternative measures that you would suggest? I, I think, um, first of all, I'll say hi to Quincy for us. We, we love Quincy. The guy who runs DC. He's a great guy. Um, I think my thing is measure something, right? And, and uh, define it and measure it and baseline it and then make adjustments. I don't, I don't think in the jail world, it's, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, when recidivism is your sole measure. But if you have the opportunity to um, develop other measures such as employment, um, such as use in other systems, we talked about the stepping up work and looking at, at individuals, for instance, staying in treatment or engaging in treatment or staying sober if they're on probation, sobriety. I think there is a myriad of measures, but I think the key is just find something that you can consistently measure agree on a definition, actually tell people what the definition is. So recidivism in my system means A, B, C, and then consistently measure it. So I, I don't think, uh, you know, I ran a jail for nine years and spent most of my career working in jails. It's very uh, complicated. And our data systems, at least in Pennsylvania jails, are terrible. Um, so even any recidivism I would have put out was a guess based on a real tight definition. But I think just the exercise of agreeing on what you're gonna measure and then measuring it and publicizing it is the critical part. I don't think the what is as important as that you do it. So you, your other question, I agree with John, uh, as I always do. Uh, your question about what do you recommend? So you have to ask yourself the question, if somebody comes into the jail and then they go to the court and the court releases them in 48 hours, 72 hours, why did they come to jail? So start to take a look at the arresting uh, processes in your jurisdiction and begin to innovate like the LEAD program out of Seattle. Los Angeles has it as well. Pre-arrest diversion, right? Starting to think about as you're, again, churning somebody through a jail is the most expensive thing that you can do. We know that the research shows that if they've been locked up for three days, the outcomes are terrible. They lose their jobs, they lose houses, they lose family, blah, 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 blah. So really look at who's coming in, why they're coming in, are there some front-end pre-arrest diversion programs that your jurisdictions, your counties can begin to engage in? Do the research on the front end. There's plenty of partners that want to help in this lane. Whether it's Pew or others, they're more than happy to help you think through it and then start using those valuable jail beds for folks that really are on a pipeline, uh, maybe to prison or to longer, longer detention settings. So, so one additional measure that I think would be, would be worth looking at is, is the safety within the facility. That, that we, we often focus on recidivism, which is a public safety measure, but I think, I think institutional safety is, is critical. And, and when, when you have inmates who are there for, for short periods of time, you wanna look at whether they're being placed in security levels where they're safe, but then staff safety too. All right, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment to bring us to a close. I'd like to say uh, thanks to the panel. Uh, this has been a very good, conversation and I hope we can learn from it. So thank you very much.